Hey, this is the great Johannes again. I've got a question for you. Can you help me understand the concept of equality? I get the impression that globalists try to solve it as follows. Say you have 100 people and you've got good, nutritious food for 10 of them and low quality food, shitty food for the other 90. What do you do? Well, the answer that globalists keep coming up with is that we throw away the good food for those 10 people and make everybody eat bugs. They do the same thing nowadays on uh, city liners. If you take, the, take a flight from Amsterdam to Vienna, for example, a lot of these flights no longer have a business class. There used to be this front section, like the front eight or 10 rows or so was business class. And they abolished it because airliners know that the economy class citizens, they can sometimes, some of them, not all of them, but a few of them can become very aggressive, very uh, angered over this apparent inequality that the economy class is, of course, humiliated by having to walk past the business class people, especially if those business class people check in first. Um, and it's even worse when you have these big fancy first class seats in an airplane and you see those uh, beautiful young children sitting there because their parents can afford <laughs> business class tickets for their kids and everybody else, the rabble, including myself, will have to sit in the back economy class. Now, personally, this, this kind of inequality never, never really bothered me, but some people are extremely bothered by it and they can give you these really angry, dirty looks and those children in the first class seats, they know, if you look at them, they know, they know that uh, average poor people can be very, very hostile toward rich people and very mean. This only further exacerbates the difference between economy class and first class, right? First class people, they really learn that the rabble is angry, the angry mob down below. You don't want to go near them. You don't want to mingle with them. Even though the majority of uh, economy class people don't have this emotional problem at all, we kind of shrug it off, right? Well, that's just how it is, right? You know, I've got other things to do. Other things are on my mind. So lots of airliners now started to abolish business class precisely for this reason, to uh, remove uh, any kind of hostility. But... If you think about it, there's a new kind of upper class, a new kind, a new kind of first class, and that is the extra legroom class. So there are now throughout the airplane several rows of seats with extra legroom. You can order those usually for a 10 euros or 20 euro upgrade on a regular flight, a city flight, a city hopper. Um, but I personally have already noticed that this also creates new anger. Uh, I booked an extra leg room for 20 euros extra on some flight. And already there were people behind me. There was a guy two seats behind me, two rows behind me. He got really angry and he wanted to conquer my seat, so to speak. He wanted to take, literally take my seat. He was, uh, you know, talking down to me, uh, disrespectful, uh, because he and his girl apparently wanted to have those better seats. I had to explain to him that I actually paid for it. I had to pay 20 euros extra for it. And it's my seat, you know. And so you see that um, we abolish one kind of inequality. We abolish business class. But then we have something else called extra legroom where you can pay for the upgrade. So now there are all sorts of extra upgrades you pay for, which is also in a way a form of business class or a form of first class, uh, different from the regular economy seats. So what was the point in doing that? What was the point in abolishing one kind of inequality only to introduce another kind, the extra legroom class? But doing this, abolishing the business class to remove this apparent class-based inequality, replacing it for a height-based inequality, uh, in which case I'm upper class being six foot five. I know there are guys way taller than I am. And again, that doesn't even bother me. Mm. What bothers me, though, is that our globalist, what, what, what do you call them, our globalist masters, our socialist intellectuals, they keep coming up with the same wrong and stupid solutions to inequality. Instead of simply accepting, you know, teaching people, know your place, you're a peasant, this is your seat in the economy in the back. Shut up. 
you know, or we'll throw you off the plane and you'll never be able be allowed to fly again. Instead of doing it that way, instead of, say, raising the prices to the opera house from 100 to 300 euros per ticket to keep the rabble out, to keep the angry people out, you know, instead of doing it that way, uh, we want to make everything equal to avoid people getting angry. You know, in one way, it makes sense that if you are Western white elite or, you know, white skinned Jewish elite, uh, living in the West, um, you see these masses of hundreds of millions of people, maybe billions of people in Africa, the Muslim world, India, and maybe even in Asia, who look to the West with jealousy. Here we have it good, apparently, even though China, I believe, technology speaking, has caught up long ago. Uh, the rich places like Abu Dhabi or Dubai in, Saudi, in, the, in the Arab nations, they're extremely wealthy as well. They have way more people. I mean, don't forget there is value in people, right? If you have like 1.3 billion Africans, how does that compare to like 500 or 50 or 700 million uh, white Europeans? You have to factor in the fact that Africans are having a lot more children. If you value those at a million dollars per child, then Africa is wealthier than Europe. And so our globalist thinkers also look at the world of food production, which is what this video was really supposed to be about. My alma mater, uh, Wageningen University and Research Center, it's a university in the Netherlands, it used to be our top rural university. Um, the Netherlands, of course, is the number one country for agricultural technology. We do so much with so little land. And we are renowned uh, throughout the world. For example, every year, thousands of Asian people from China, for example, come over to the Netherlands to study agricultural technology uh, at Wageningen University. Um, and I say we used to be the top in this field because for some reason the Netherlands is breaking down several uh, fields of study, namely pastoralism. Our uh, cattle farmers are being driven out of the, of the Netherlands. Um, our prime minister, our political leadership, claims that this is what the people want. The people want to get rid of the pastoralists because we see these beautiful green pastures and we imagine parking lots and, you know, uh, shopping centers and shopping malls and whatever, right? Plow it full of housing for immigrants and whatnot. This is no joke, by the way. One of the farmers in the Netherlands who was disowned lately, literally the next day, the day after his disownment, he was bought out by the government. They gave him like, you know, money to leave. Literally the next day, plans were announced to start building housing for immigrants on that former farmland. So what are we doing here? The World Economic Forum is a sort of globalist enterprise that behaves as though they think they're the world government. And although I think this is a Western plot, I don't think Russia and China are that involved in the World Economic Forum. But Western people want to build the world government and rule the world, obviously. That's what the elites want. And this World Economic Forum has started building uh, food innovation hubs throughout the world. And one of these, the European one, is going to be centered in Wageningen, you know, in the heart of the Netherlands, the rural university of the Netherlands is in tight contact with the World Economic Forum. And so what are they really going to do? Well, it comes down to this problem of inequality. If you've been listening to what the media have been telling you about red meat, you may have come to believe falsely that red meat is bad. It's not good for you. It's unhealthy. It causes blah, 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 all sorts of Cancers? No, no, it doesn't. Turns out, if you watch this other YouTube channel called uh, Low Carb Down Under, there's a whole series of videos by Australian researchers who have basically are telling you the truth that meat, red meat in particular, or even beef liver in particular, is the healthiest food a human being can possibly eat, even in large quantities. Large quantities of red meat are just fine for you. You could actually survive on red meat with fat and water. You get your protein, your fat, and your nutrients. Why? Because all the nutrients you need are in the meat. You know, the animals that we eat, they eat plants, they eat fruit, right? They eat everything, they eat, and so they process that for us so that we can access their meat, and their meat contains everything we need, all the protein, all the micronutrients, all the vitamins, it's all there in red meat. Did you know, for example, that 100 grams of beef 
contains more vitamin C than 100 grams of orange. And they always tell you, right, you have to, you know, if, you're, if you have the flu or something, they tell you, oh, you should have more vitamin C, drink more orange juice. But you could better, rather just eat more red meat because it's got even more vitamin C in it. But the inequality here is so that clearly we understand that not all people in the world have access to the best quality foods. Now, people of Northwestern Europe are lucky because their low-lying land around the North Sea and the Baltic Sea is excellent. It has, it has the exact right climate for pastoralism, and it has, uh, because it's low-lying land, it is flooded with water, with rain that flows there. Uh, also, the Rhine Delta and the Netherlands, for example, all of this all of this land is perfect for pastoralism, and in many cases, you cannot use it for anything else. It is, for example, too watery, too swampy for normal agriculture. You cannot really grow crops there. It is also too soft to build more housing there. The, the, the Rhine Delta in the Netherlands, you cannot build skyscrapers there. If you've ever wondered why Amsterdam doesn't look more like New York City with these mega tall, you know, 200 story uh, skyscrapers, there, the answer is. Uh, Amsterdam is built on water. It's basically half of the city is floating on water. You cannot build tall buildings there. It will sink. All right? So the inequality of food, the food inequality, this is what the World Economic Forum wants to solve using their food innovation hubs. And the main one for Europe is going to be centered in Wageningen, Wageningen University Research Center. If we cannot give all people in the world the healthiest foods, meaning animal fat and animal protein, which you get from red meat, red meat with the fat on it. All right? If we cannot give all people this high quality food, then people will be jealous of us because the, the Northwest Europeans, the people of white European stock, I mean, the Northwest Europeans and the North Americans, for example, they get to eat all the good stuff, all the red meat. And that means they get to be physically healthy. Not really. In North America, people are overly fat and that's because they're eating way too many carbs. You know, you can store your fat in two places. You can store the fat in your own body. When, that means you carry it around. Or you can store it in the food in your fridge. Let me explain that for a little bit. The reason why people are overweight is because they're eating low-fat foods, high-carb foods, sugary foods. And so your body will then have to transform these carbs and sugars into fat that you can store in your own body since you're not eating fat. You have to have it in your own body. But if you eat a lot of fat, your body will register this and say, hey, hey, if we're eating so much fat, then we don't need to carry it around. And so what happens is your body starts to burn more fat. Uh, yeah, you start digesting your own fat to the point where you become extremely lean again. Uh, and since you're eating all the fat that you need, you don't need to store it in your own body. So a low carb, high fat diet will automatically see you losing weight. You will lose the fat in your body because your body doesn't need to keep on, hold on to it. Whereas if you eat a high carb, low fat diet, that's the worst. That's why you see so many big fat people in North America, the United States especially, where half of the American citizens are overweight. Why? Because they eat way too many carbs. They eat their fries, they eat their cornflakes, they eat all sorts of garbage that forces their body to convert that into fat and hold on to it. I get the feeling that this video is a little bit of a, a mixed match of all sorts of topics that I'm throwing together. You know, it's not very structured, but um, so I'm going to wrap it up a little bit. Uh, the food innovation hubs from the, of the World Economic Forum, what are they going to do? The point is they're going to throw away all the good food. They're going to say nobody can eat, you know, top food like red meat with uh, animal fat and animal protein. No, 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 no. That's that causes inequality that will make the people who can eat red meat will make them physically healthier, at least in Europe, and uh, young people who exercise a little bit. We don't want people to be physically superior. We want everybody to be physically weak. We want everybody to become the sort of small hobbits who eat carrots all day. And we don't want to have these big, tall, six foot five or taller guys uh, eating red meat all day <laughs> so they can go to the gym and grow muscle. No, we don't want that. We want everybody to turn, we want to turn everybody into a hobbit. And the World Economic Forum is going to do that by driving out the pastoralists of Northwestern Europe. And the Netherlands is the number one meat exporter to other European countries. And so what is going to happen is they're going to turn that 
pasture in the Netherlands, they're going to turn that into industry, industrial factories where they will produce fake meat, fake protein, plant-based protein, uh, lab-grown meat. I don't know. I don't think that's the same quality as the regular meat because they say they do lab-grown meat. They say they, they want to grow meat in the lab so they can control the fat content of this meat, which already suggests that what they're really going to do is they're going to grow low-fat meat. But low-fat meat is stupid. You're supposed to eat meat with the fat. You're supposed to eat you know, meat with at least 20% fat or so. If you have minced meat, it says if it's 10% or 20%. 20% minced meat fat is really good because you will be on a high-fat, low-carb diet a ketogenic diet, they call it, and that is actually extremely healthy for you. It will automatically make you lose weight. Now, why on earth would you want to give people a low-fat version of meat? <clears throat> well, the answer is, if the meat is low-fat and it's just protein, you're going to have to eat a lot of it. Get it? You're going to have to eat a lot of the high-protein, low-fat meat in order to get your fat quantity in, and that means they can sell you more food. You know, all these food, food companies around the world, the food multinationals, they don't care about your health. They just care about their profits. They want to sell you more food, especially the food that is least nutritious. The less nutritious the food is that they can sell you, the more you will have to eat of it, right? They're going to do the same thing with lab-grown meat. They're going to reduce the fat quantity in, in this fake meat, so you're going to have to eat a lot of it, a lot more of it which is good for their sales and their turnover and their profit margin, but it's absolutely worthless for you. And I want to end this video quoting what an Aboriginal man once said when they caught a you know, big game animal, they killed it, they opened its belly with their knives, and they found that this animal contained very little fat. And then the Aboriginal man refused to eat it and said, it's rubbish. And that's what it is. Low-fat diets are rubbish.